Today, uh, I've titled our talk simply this, Where is the Love? Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7 is what we're going to be looking at today. And basically, what I want you to see is this is Jesus talking to his church. Uh, How do I know that? Well, there's red print in my Bible. I don't know about yours, but I have red print. No, but if you read this, it's Jesus talking to his churches, and Jesus commends his church, but he also challenges his church. He, he, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus speaks, and here's what you'll see. He does not pamper his people, okay? He does not pamper them because he loves them too much for that. Anybody who loves you, church, will not just pamper you. They will also push you and challenge you because they know there's something bigger and better. Are you with me? So Jesus doesn't pamper his church. He loves his people enough just not to comfort them but to confront them where they're at. So as we look at this, what we're going to see is Jesus loves his people. He loves them enough to convict them, to cleanse them, to challenge them. And get, get I, I really want you to see this and get this. Jesus challenges them with stern warnings of impending judgment. It's going to come. So he's just not patting them on the back. He's going face to face and he's saying, all right, church. Here's some things you're doing well, however, and then we're going to read about these in the next few weeks, the church is in a battle, okay? Every one of us in here, uh, the reality is we're living life on a battlefield. Either we know Jesus and we're on the battlefield, or we don't know Jesus and we're on the battlefield. Either way, we're all on a battlefield. It's a war. We battle with sin. We battle with evil. We battle with suffering on a daily basis. Aren't you familiar with this as followers of Jesus, right? I'm not not saying anything new. We face temptation every day to turn from Christ, right, to trust ourselves rather than trust in Jesus. We face the challenge to obey Christ or to disobey Christ, we, we face this thing about trusting in ourselves rather than our all-sufficient Jesus, our true Savior. So we're in this battle all across this room right now. I truly believe there's battles that are raging in marriages, in our minds, in our souls. It's all over the room. There's some who are battling with physical suffering, and, and as I've been studying Revelation, I've just been so refreshed to know this. Someday Jesus is coming back, and he's going to make it all right. That gives me so much peace and freedom to go, you know what? No matter what has happened in my life, what will happen in my life, someday Jesus will return, and someday I will see him. That's comforting, church. I'm I'm not afraid to see Jesus. You shouldn't be afraid to see Jesus unless you don't know Jesus. But if you know him, there's a peace that comes with this. And the day's coming, but for now, we're in a battle, right? How's the battle going? That's the question. We're all in it. We're in a war. We're in a war for our own souls, for the souls of men and women all around the world who don't know Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Through his love, through his mercy, through his grace, we can have victory. We can have hope. We can have freedom. And the reality is, this is a much larger battle than just us. This is the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. So it even goes cosmic, all right? It's bigger than just our own personal lives. And here's the good news. We see Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 walking, get this, walking amongst his churches. This is what picture we have of Jesus. And this should bring us so much joy. And here's what he's doing. He's calling the church to hold fast. He's calling the church, have patience. He's also calling us to walk in purity. That's holiness. In a world that's filled with sin and evil, he's calling his church, you know what? You should stand out like a sore thumb. 
If you know Jesus, they should know. And he's calling his church to stand out in this culture of sin and evil and to live with a passion. The most passionate people in our world today should not be hockey fans, football fans, but they should be followers of Jesus. They should be the most passionate people we know in the world today. And whenever that word is used, it goes right to Jesus. We should have passion for Christ to proclaim the gospel. Get this, even when you're afraid. And I'm a pastor and sometimes I'm afraid. Like God gives me the opportunity, fear comes in and sometimes I blow it. But we need to share the gospel even when we're Afraid. What will people think of me? What will they say to me? What if they ask me that question? All I'm telling you is just embrace it and share the gospel and see what the Spirit of God does. Even following Jesus may cost you your life, and spiritually speaking, it already has. If you have true Christianity, you've died to yourself. So your life is no longer about you. It's about Jesus Christ. That's why I can stand up here and say it's not about me. Because the gospel put me where? In the grave. And raised me up to what? Live for Jesus. So that's why our life is never about us or about me. So if you're confused as to why does Pastor Howie always say this isn't about me, it's because if you got the gospel, you died to yourself. Because there's something greater than you in your life on this earth. There's a plan that God's working out. And he calls out his church. He calls out those who are compromising. He calls out those whose faith is wavering. He calls them out. And he warns them. He he warns them this way. Do not fall away. He calls them out and he warns them. And in the end he promises this. I'm coming soon. And I've said this before. In light of eternity, he is coming soon. He is coming soon. Uh, I will not give you a time or a date because we have no clue. But I will say this. In light of eternity, Jesus is coming soon. So we got to ask ourselves the question, are you ready? He urges us to be ready. The Bible says, those, right, should, those of us who know Jesus, we should be looking and longing for his return. Did you wake up today and even think today could be the day my king arrives? Did you think that? I want to do all of these things this morning. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be comforted. I want you to be strengthened. Because we're in a battle. And you need that in a battle. But at the same time, here's what I've been praying all week. I pray and there's a, that there's a deep conviction this morning. I've been praying that the Spirit of God would, would draw people here to search their hearts. A deep conviction in the way of, am I compromising anything in my life that I need to get right back on track and give glory to Jesus that I need to repent of? Is my witness in the world, is my light almost burnt out? Am I shining my light bright to a lost, dark world? If I'm not, why not? My prayer is that Christ would awaken us. My prayer is that Christ would wake us up, church. We're in a battle. There are people right now who have died, and the reality is they've gone to hell because they don't know Jesus as their Savior. We're on mission for those people, those lost people who don't know Jesus. We want them. We desire for them to know Jesus. And then we know this. He's bringing a reward for those who persevere. I desire, church, for you to persevere so that in the end, when you stand before Jesus, you are rewarded. It's my heart for our church is that we just don't go through motions. And Jesus here in this letter to the churches, he brings the most dominant rebuke to each of these churches. And here's 
the dominant rebuke. rebuke. If we read chapters 2 and 3, here's what we're going to see that, that Jesus really gets at. It's a failure to confess the word of God to the world around them. That's his rebuke. You know me, but you're not telling people about me. You're not living for my glory. They're not seeing me in your life, in your church. So here's the deal. These churches are commended. They're rebuked for a variety of things. But if you had to nail down one theme, one thing that characterizes all of these encouragements, all of these rebukes, here's what it is. They all revolve around confessing God's word and carrying out God's mission in this world. I put a quote on Facebook a few, about a week and a half ago. I'm going to read it to us. It's from Brad House. He's the community group pastor at Mars Hill Church. But he says this. Our churches are filled with people who agree with the mission but do not own it. Ownership is marked by joy-filled sacrifice that sees kingdom work as a get-to because of what Christ has done rather than a got-to of Christian duty. Ownership looks like people serving the church, serving the city with a passion for the gospel. It looks like people cheerfully and sacrificially giving out a love for Jesus to see the work of the gospel move forward. Ownership looks like people participating in the messiness of community, being inconvenienced for the sake of another sanctification. If you want to test your church's ownership level, here's three markers. How many people serve? How many people give to the church? And how many people are committed in community? This is huge. Here's the problem in the church at Ephesus. They were holding tight to the word of God. They loved the word of God. They were guarding it, and they were being very intentional about not compromising the word of God. But here's what happened. They abandoned the love they had at first. They loved the word of God. They guarded it, but they abandoned the first love. And you might go, well, Howie, what does that mean? That, is that love for God? And I would say, well, it certainly is the foundation They have abandoned some love for God, but there's more. All you got to do, we went through the whole book, is look at Acts chapter 19, and here's what you find out in Ephesus. Paul starts a church in Ephesus. He, remember, he left the synagogue. He went to the tyrant's house, and he preached there for two years. And it says that everybody in that area heard the word of God. People responded to the gospel. They were saved. They went out all through Asia sharing the gospel. It's right there in Acts chapter 19. They all heard it. So people are hearing the word of God from Ephesus. Paul starts the church. The people rally around the gospel and they spread the word of God. Here's what they're doing. They're loving people enough to tell them about Jesus. If you really love people, you will tell them about Jesus. You just won't give them groceries. You just won't mow their grass, but you'll tell them about Jesus. If you really love them, you will share Jesus. I was so challenged Friday. Uh, I've shared his story before, but uh, Dave's story, he's a pastor in uh, just in Blackville in that area of Miramichi, Uh, He has two churches about to look and praying for God to plant another church in Fredericton. And here's what he said to me Friday night. He said, Howie, I want you to know, here's what happened our first year as a church. Uh, We went to everybody in our community and we served them and we told them about Jesus. I had letters written to me, hate mail, but he, he said this, 60 people came to know Jesus. And then he said this, those 60 people are still in the church, serving Jesus, bearing fruit, and leading others to Christ. And I said, Dave, I I wish I had that story, but I don't. I could tell you that Centerpoint was filled with people, but as the years went on, those people have walked away. Maybe some have gone to other churches, bless them in that, but some 
have wavered. That's powerful, church. 60 people, first year. Church is now 160, growing. Second church is 140, growing. Converts. And I go, what, what is it? And he goes, we pray. And then we tell them they need Jesus. And if they hate us, they hate us. Church, we're on a mission. You need to see it. Don't be afraid to share Jesus. See, we can hold tight to the word of God, right? You can sit with someone and say, no, Jesus is the only way. Here it is. And you win the argument, but you don't win their heart. This is Ephesus. They love the truth. They just don't love the people. And you may remember this, because in Ephesus, when it first started, they loved who? The people. They loved Jesus, and they loved the people. I've heard churches even say, well, at least we stand on truth, and if we stay this small in number, that's okay. No. A church should be what? Growing spiritually, numerically. We should be owning the mission that God's called us to. Here's the problem. They're sitting back, they're coasting, they're compromising. They got a get out of hell free card. And they (laughs) forgot there's other people who need to hear the message. So church, let's ask this question. Remember those of you here today who are married, I know if you're single and you're a lady, you have this already planned out in your head. But let's go back to the wedding day. Remember that day? Just did a wedding in here. Dave and Keisha just got married, come to Centerpoint. But do you remember your wedding day? It was so joyous. Remember that? So filled with so much joy and happiness. And and, uh, remember that. Because there's a lot of marriages that don't make it. So, So that day that's so joyous, and think about this. For marriages that end to the day when divorce papers are signed, you've got to ask yourself the question, what happened? What happened? How, how about parents? Right? Your child is born. Remember that? Parents? The joy. Then they turn 13 and they're a nuisance and a brat <laughs> driving you crazy and up the wall. Are you there? Have you been there? Okay, good. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting you where you are then. What, what happens? The question, how, how about the loved one who goes to the hospital and finds out they got this horrible disease and they're going to have to be taken care of, but just think about this. What happens between the time that you have those, that love feeling for them to the time they become a burden? What happens? I'll tell you what happens. You abandoned the first love. You abandoned the first love. Divorced spouses, frustrated parents, burdened family members abandoned the first love. What was once passionate love, passionate care, gradually, I said gradually, not instantly, but gradually, leads to abandoning the love. Doesn't happen overnight. That's why people can't say, we, we just fell out of love. No. What you did was you didn't work at your marriage. And that gradually, gradually led to separation, led to divorce. Maybe we're sitting here and we're going, you know what? I remember when I was passionate For Jesus, I remember when I was passionate for my family, and now you're just trudging through. Maybe Christianity's become more like this. You're hanging on. You're just doing your duty. There's no joy. It's sort of like, all right, it's Sunday morning. I guess we'll get up and do the church thing. Oh, man, the power was out last night. We sort of slept in till 8.30. Church is 10.30. No, we have a two-hour window. We can't make it. This is where we are. 
Do you value the church? Do you love the church? And just not center point. My heart is if you come to center point that you love this local body and that you serve for the glory of Jesus to see the gospel go forward. But, but this gradually comes, right? We're just trudging through. Ever have those seasons? Okay, we all do, right? I'm the pastor and there's days I don't even want to get up here and preach. I'm with you. Not saying I got this all figured out, but what I'm saying is trudge through because there's joy. It's going to come. It's right there. Push through, persevere. It's not a duty. This has never been a game. This is just not something we do, church. I guess I'll do the church thing. No, you are the church. Rise up, awaken, and serve for the glory of Jesus. And, and here's what happens. Here's the true reason we abandon our first love. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 38. It's simply this, that we are to love who? With all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The Lord. When we don't love Jesus with everything we have, we abandon our love for him. That's what we do. That's why this thing, becomes duty. Well, I better read it. He might be happy with me if I read it. That heart, there's no joy. There's no true happiness. God is not pleased by us obeying out of duty. I want you to understand that, okay? God's not pleased with us to just go through the motion. If it does not flow from genuine love. And here's what Jesus does to his church at Ephesus. This is why Jesus is so amazing. He calls them forth to the first love that he requires of them. So today, think of this. Jesus just isn't talking to the church of Ephesus. Jesus is talking to Centerpoint Church today. Okay? So we're going to read these letters. Verse 1, here's what we see. And right away we see the authority of Jesus. What right does Jesus have, have to say to, this, to his churches? What right does he have? Well, he's authoritative. He reigns, right? Because some people will question, well, why does Jesus have to say that? Can I tell you, Jesus is a senior pastor at Center Point Church. What Jesus says matters more than what I say, what Josh says, what you think. So, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars. Remember the seven stars last Sunday? They're the angels of the churches. He, he holds them in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So, the first thing Jesus addresses to the church at Ephesus is this. And remember, the church in Ephesus, we might go... Well, Howie, the Bible's sort of out of date, but can I tell you what was rampant in Ephesus was sex, prostitution. Their temple was built to the goddess Diana, who was the sex god, basically. So they would go to the temple to participate in sexual parties, to pay for prostitutes, church. That happens today. It's just called the internet for a lot of people. And we might go, well, that's just horrible and sick what happens in Ephesus. Ephesus, it happens today. Okay? So Ephesus was a huge city of trade. It was prosperous because of the trade that was associated with the temple. There was a huge cult following of the goddess Diana. Are you with me? We have a huge cult following today of the goddess of sex today. So we don't go, Ephesus is a city that we can't relate to. We can relate to it because there's people all the time worshiping, giving their bodies to that. So here's what I love. The God that Jesus is able to commend his church in the midst of that culture is absolutely amazing. Are you with me? They haven't compromised. The church is standing out. In fact, the city of Ephesus, they hated Christians because here's what Christians did. It stopped the income from coming in because they weren't participating in what? The sexual practices, the cult following. They, they were serving Jesus, loving Jesus. People hated them. 
Have you been there? Standards are different because you love Jesus. People are giving you a hard time. In fact, some even hate you because your standards are different. Those who stand against pressures don't have it easy. It's easy to compromise rather than swim against the stream. It is, right? It's easier to give in. How, how about this church? Stand empowered by the Spirit. Even though it's hard, there will be true victory. Stand against the pressures. Here's, here's what Jesus has done. He's told John to write, write. And in the first part of verse 1, he says, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Here's what it's getting at. Jesus has authority over the angels. Jesus has authority over who? The church. That's us. And he walks among the lampstands. That's the church. That's what the lampstands are standing for in the book of Revelation. So here's what he says to them, verses 2 to 6. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But have you tested those uh, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you. Here, here's how he introduces it. But, but I have this against you, that you have what? Abandoned the love you had at first. Here's what Jesus says in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you what? Repent. Howie, why do you always talk about repentance right there? Jesus calls us to what? Repentance. A Christian's life is one of continual repentance. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Notice Jesus just used the word hate. But I thought he was a, a savior of love. I read two times he hates the works, and he also wants us to hate the works. So Jesus starts by what? Encouraging. Some of you have the gift of encouragement, right? I, I love you guys because you see the good in all people, right? You start off and you're like, you're so, and it's like you could be whatever to them. They have the gift of encouragement. Some of you don't have that gift, right? And all you do is criticize. So you need a guard and say, let's try to bring some encouragement. And when I criticize, how do I criticize in love? Are you with me? Because we do need to challenge people. We do need to go there with some. So here's the positives. Let's start off with encouragement. How about that? So prepare yourself. We're going on a roller coaster. It's encouragement. And then you're going to be convicted by the Spirit. He tells them, first thing, I know your works. I know your works. Jesus knows the good things you have done. Even if nobody noticed, Jesus knows. And all that matters is that Jesus knows. Are you discouraged? I served my neighbor and they didn't notice what I did for them. I dropped groceries off on their doorstep and they didn't even know it was me. I had this friend... In Winnipeg, Ben, he was a great guy. He had a, a biker, a Harley biker for his neighbor. He was right into it, hardcore. And one day, one Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, Ben got his lawnmower out, went over and started mowing his neighbor's grass, only to be greeted with a window going up and two middle fingers telling him to stop and some nice, pleasant words to go with it. What was Ben doing? He was serving... Jesus, and trying to bless his neighbor, but his neighbor did not receive what? <laughs> the, the blessing. Have you ever been there? You're, you're, like, I'll say, I've helped some people, all right, I'm not saying who they are and what I did, only to be slandered by them, 
only to be talked about behind my back by them. And I go, for the glory of Jesus. That's who we serve. Are you with me? Have you ever done something for someone and it was met with no thankfulness, no gratitude? Okay, good. Because Jesus knows your works. He knows your works. Second thing, he knows their toil. He, third thing, he knows their patient endurance, right? They're persevering. Fourth thing, Jesus knows that they cannot bear with those who are what? Evil. The church in Ephesus was not able to tolerate evil doers. That's a good thing. We don't have the time of day for evil doers. Even in a world that thinks we're intolerant, we don't win the world's approval by compromising church. So if they want to label us intolerant, they can label us intolerant because we serve who? Jesus. And we hate because Jesus hates evil things. Sixth thing. He, he, he encourages them because not only do they hate those who teach the evil things, they found them to be false. Some people were going around to the churches claiming to be apostles out of the original 12. And here's what they did. They would come into the churches, they would examine their teaching, they would find out their teaching is false, and they would cast them, throw them out of the church. Here's what they're doing in our terms. They're shooting wolves. They're examining false teachers, they're false. And I'd tell you today, we have false messengers all through our churches. So you just don't take everything at face value, church. Just because someone throws in the name Jesus doesn't mean that's the true gospel. You discern, you study, you, you get to know scripture, you get to know your Bible. Seventh thing, he does this twice. He returns to endurance. You're enduring. Jesus notices this. Eighth thing, you're bearing up, what? For my name's sake. And here's the ninth. You have not grown weary. That's Isaiah 40, 31. Run, but not be weary. Nine good things. Two categories. We can group them in. Number one, deeds. They're doing some what? Good deeds. Second category, we can group all of these encouragements in. Theology, doctrine. I, I will throw out because I'm a big supporter of this. Theology and doctrine matters. I've heard people say, we don't need doctrine. All we need is love. No, you need doctrine and you need love. And the balance is loving but keeping good theology and doctrine. That's the challenge. Everything about their theology is good. Everything about their deeds is good. But the one thing that the church lacks, which Jesus points out in verse 4, indicates this. That the Ephesian church is just plowing through. That they're just lost that former zeal, former passion for Jesus. In fact, what it says to us, they're slipping into the all common phase of many churches today of just going through the motions. Go to church, stand, sit. Stand at center point, stand, 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 <laughs> sit. Right? Okay. By, by the way, if you want to sit, you sit. If you want to stand, you stand. Are you with me? But going through the motions. All right. Bible time, message time, open up, revelation. All right. What's for lunch? Yeah, that's going to be good. What do we, oh, we have that this week. That's going to be amazing. Try, try battling those thoughts and preaching. <laughs> Jesus says, you have abandoned your first love. You've abandoned your first love. The idea is this. You, you no longer express a zeal, a passion for me. It's gone. Our primary role, church, in relation to Jesus is that we are light 
to an outside world in darkness. That's why I've said, center point, we need to care more, more about lost people than we do about our personal comforts. Our primary role with Jesus is this, that we shine the light bright to people lost in the dark. But Jesus doesn't tell them what he has against them without a plan of action. Are you with me? Good news, right? I have this against you, and they go, oh, man. But then he says, but here, here's my plan of action. He, he wants them to rekindle that passionate flame. If you're here today and you have lost the passion for Jesus today, Jesus wants you to what? Rekindle the passion. Ever meet those people? They're as passionate on fire. They, you, you get with them. All they do is talk about Jesus. Their life could be a mess, but they're still what? Passionate. They have joy. So here's what he does. Here's his action plan so that they could shine bright as lamps. First thing, remember. Action plan number one, remembering. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. I remember, it'll be almost 10 years ago, starting to date my wife, Kelsey, and we started dating. It'll be 10 years this February coming. And here's what I want to tell you. She was in Texas. I was in Winnipeg. But I became a phone guy. There are no such things as phone guys. <laughs> right? Any males in here say, oh, I love to talk on the phone for hours. No, and if you just said that, you have manhood, it's robbed, right? Are you with me? <laughs> like, we're taking your man card. <laughs> what guy likes to talk on the phone for hours? Haven't met him. But you throw in a beautiful girl who's there. <laughs> so from 1 a.m., Till four in the morning, I would be on the phone talking to Kelsey. I would get off the phone to get ready to go to work to the church. <laughs> and yeah, I, I did. I was young. I could live on a few hours sleep. Now, I'd, I'd just be, it, I'd be, it, it wouldn't work out well. <laughs> you would know why we have a couch in the office if I still did that. <laughs> and I don't do that now. But we'd be on the phone for hours on end, church. And, and here's, I, I, right, it was the day before text messaging. It was MSN Messenger. And I couldn't wait after I finished talking because Kel worked at the church in Texas. And she could what? At lunch, she could get on MSN Messenger and talk to me. And we could, it's like texting, only before texting. <laughs> And we would do this rare thing, right? We would write on paper with this instrument called a pen. And we'd write down questions and things we were feeling. And then we would go to the post office. We wouldn't hit send, but we would put it in an envelope and <laughs> lick it with our tongue and, and, and put a stamp on it. And we'd drop it in this rare thing called what? The, the mailbox, and it would fall down there, and someone would magically come and pick it up, and it would get to her, and she would read it, and then she would email me, and this was beautiful. Have you been there? All right? I'm, I'm a 90s product, but some of you at horse and carriage, you've been there, pigeons. <laughs> I had to get it in. The first love was dedicated. Are you with me? It was passionate. You've been there. You've been there. It was diligent. It was disciplined. It was powerful. It was all-consuming. Here's the question, Christian. How long has it been since you felt that way about Jesus? That's the question. Did you wake up today going... I get to meet with the one who walks amongst his church. Not only in the morning, but as I'm driving in my car, as I'm putting the kids down for a nap, I can meet with Jesus. Do you remember what it was that made you feel the first desperate, give everything to follow Jesus. Remember those days? 
I'll give it all. He's totally worth it. Do you remember what made you ready to want to throw your life away? I don't care as long as I follow Jesus. He can send me to Africa. I don't care. Been there? Christian, how long has it been since you felt the holiness of God exposing all your selfishness and your sin? How long? And when you feel the weight of your sin, does it cause you to want to deal with it or to ignore it, to repress it? If you're passionate about Jesus, you will deal with it. You will feel the weight of it. Does it cause you, when you see your sin, to wonder in amazement at the gospel that Jesus died for that sin, that Jesus took that sin, that Jesus covered that sin by his blood. Are you blown away? And if you are, here's what you do. You just deal with it. You hate it so much. You repent and then you move on. The steadfast love of Jesus towards you, church, it reaches to the heavens. Stretches right to the skies. His love for you is amazing. He actually places a rock under your feet, but just doesn't leave that rock there. He upholds that rock, and that's a firm foundation. Here's the thing. If you know and love Jesus, he loves you. He loves you, church. Do you remember this? Do you stand by faith in Christ, fully forgiven? Or do you stand shameful, accused? If you're a Christ follower, you shouldn't stand shameful. You shouldn't stand accused. He's forgiven you. He's cleansed you. Do you stand before Jesus, cleansed, sanctified, adopted, and welcomed? That's the question. When we get the power of the gospel, we become people who want to lay down our lives. Not only lay down our lives for Jesus, but lay down our lives for who? Other people, for the church, on mission. You got to see this. We become people who want to serve the way our king served. Remember the gospel. It makes us want to love other people the way we've been loved. Ever been annoyed with someone? Ever been angry with someone? And then have you ever just stopped to go, right, I'm really angry, I'm really annoyed. How about me standing beside Jesus? Oh, man. How wretched am I? All right, you got me. I forgive you. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have been angry. That was sin. That's what? That's called humble pie eat it often. Are you with me? Compare yourself to Jesus and then pull up to the table and eat. But Howie, they don't deserve my forgiveness. Look to Jesus. Did did you deserve his forgiveness? No. Did he give it to you? Yes. I forgive you. Right? But the more passion you have for Jesus, it's like this. I forgive you. No problem. We all mess up. We all say things we shouldn't. And and I'm not saying downplay it, but I'm saying it's easier to what? Forgive. In fact, Christians should be the hardest people to offend. And it's great to see the Spirit of God, but I've had people come to me and say, Howie, the way I sent that email or that, I'm so sorry. And I go, "I, I didn't take it that way at all. But I'm glad you're obeying the Spirit's leading. Church, obedience to God matters. He says, remember where you have fallen. Remember the gospel. Second thing, the word we all love, repent. Turn away from the thinking that makes you take Jesus for granted. That's Repentance means I'm going to turn away. I'm, I'm going to turn from it. So turn away from things that make you lose sight of his worth. 
Anything in your life that is taking worth away from Jesus? Well, turn away from it. Turn away from things that dull your appreciation for the Bible. And I'm not here to say, let's bring all our TVs here next Sunday and we'll burn them. Let's have a bonfire. But what I'm saying is, what are things that cause this to become dull? Turn away. Spend time with God in His Word. Turn away from things that steal your time for prayer. It's huge. Did you know in Scripture God says this, if you come to me and ask, I will give you anything you ask for. (laughs) Do we really believe it, church? You have problems? Who are you running to? Other people? Woe is me. Here's my story. Have you talked to Jesus who said this, anything you ask in my name, I will give it. That's proper relationship with God. Repentance of sin, empowered by the Spirit. You know what? God, I'm praying for my, my, my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter. And you say here in your word, and I've searched my heart, and my heart is pure. By your grace, you save them. Are you praying like that? Do you sit down and pray for your loved ones like that? Church, it's there. What is it that is keeping you away from intimacy with Jesus? Turn away from it. Turn away from it. Church, what is it that keeps you away from Bible, from prayer? Get this, from committing yourself to a local church. Some people go, ah, oh, commitment, I'm scared, ah, oh, run! No, Jesus loves his church. He committed himself to his church. And my challenge is that you would find a local church that loves Jesus, that loves the Bible, and you would commit to it, become members of it, serve it for his glory, for his honor. What is it that keeps you from that? What is it that keeps you from going all out for Jesus, reliance on Jesus? Because here's the thing, your soul and your joy depends on Jesus. And loving Jesus and serving Jesus. Here's the third thing he tells them. Do. Remember, repent, and do what? What does he say? Do the works you did at first. New Christian, remember that day? You were like, do you have a Bible study? Give me something. I will take it all. Give it, give it, give it. And then I'm doing, doing, doing. And then we got to saddle you in, right? Haul you in. Remind you, it's just not all about the doing. Intimacy with Jesus, knowing him, loving him, leads to doing that honors him. Some people skip that and they're just doers. And they miss, have I spent time with Jesus? Is he building me? Is my character Christ-like? Are you with me? Because someone's just like, I'll do, I'll do. And it's like, you need to have intimacy with Jesus before you do anything. How serious is Jesus about this abandoning the first love? Well, let's look at it. Here's what he says. If you don't do this, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember, lampstands symbolize the church. Chapter 1, verse 20. Here's what Jesus is saying. It's nothing less than a promise to unchurch the church. If they do not repent, Jesus says, he will take away their standing as a church. Jesus has every right to start new churches and to close existing churches. Are you with me? He has every right. He has the authority to do it. If They will not put into play their call to be a lamp of witness. Here's what it says. Their lamp will be removed. Let's talk about the Old Testament. Let's talk about Israel. Zechariah chapter 4. Israel was symbolized as a lamp. Are you with me? What happened to Israel? Just successive generations neglected Jesus. And soon Jesus took their lamp away and he started this new thing called the church 
God removed them as his light-bearing people, and he transferred the light to where? His church, New Testament. We're in his church. So here's what Jesus is doing. He's warning his church. Have you read that verse and just been struck? Like, whoa, that's pretty stern, Jesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, Unless you repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Get this, Revelation 2, 16, If you do not repent, I will come to you soon, war against you with the sword of my mouth. We've talked what that is. That's eternal salvation, and that's judgment. He's coming to judge, double-edged sword. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's speaking to his church, Revelation 2, 22 and 23. If she refuses to repent, I will throw her out onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. Revelation 3.3. 3. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. He's basically saying, I'm coming as a robber. And here's Revelation 3.16. All of us in the church probably know it. I will spit you out of my mouth. Start, startling verses, aren't they, church? Get your attention? It seems to imply these Christians are endangered by rege being rejected by Jesus. And I'd simply ask the question, what's going on here? So follow me, because this is key. Jesus is doing what we see all throughout Scripture. And I'll say this to start. There are people who believe you can lose your salvation. There are people over here who believe once saved, all, always saved. Are you with me? So, well, where do you stand, Howie? Well, I'm sort of in the middle. W what do you mean, the middle? Uh, I don't believe scripture teaches you can lose your salvation because God's the author of it. However, I don't believe once saved, always saved either. Well, what do you mean? Let's talk about it. If you believe you can lose your salvation, are you welcomed at center point? Yeah. If you believe once saved, always saved, are you welcomed? Yeah. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged because you're going to see God's the author of salvation. Not you. I was five years old in a dirt pit, picking my nose with Hot Wheels. <laughs> and Jesus saved me. I wasn't there going, I'm such a sinner. No, I was like, this is awesome, right? And looking back on it, when else can you sit in a dirt pit, pick your nose, and play with Hot Wheels? It doesn't happen. I'm 34. That'd be crazy. Are you with me? All right. Here, here's, let's read some verses, because here's where a lot of people run to. Well, Howie, there's lots of verses that say you can lose your salvation. Hebrews chapter 3, 11 to 14. It's going to come up here. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leaving you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, for we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. We read that, the passage seems to imply this, it's possible for Christians to lose their salvation, but church... If we study our Bibles, if we're good stud students of God's Word, we need to understand what? The context. We always got to understand the context of the passage. Hebrews 3, this passage in Revelation chapter 2, they're passages that are not written to Christians who are thriving in their faith. Are you with me? They're written to wavering Christians who are weak in their faith. You need to see the context. These aren't people who are on zeal, passion for Jesus, loving Jesus, serving on mission for Jesus. They're written to people who are endangered of giving in to the persecution, of abandoning their first love, of leaving Jesus Christ. And here's what, what it's really getting at. It's, it's getting at those who are wavering. And all through Scripture, God is saying to wavering, read your Bibles, church. Don't fall away. It's all over. Are you with me? It's there all the time. And this kind of warning, if you know and love Jesus, here's what it does. It draws you back. Do you waver? I do. Do you lack faith and trust sometimes? 
But when you read that, does it draw you right back to how amazing Jesus is? And if you know and love him, it does. Are you trying to do things in your own power and then you read scripture and you realize, you know what? God can handle that. Does it draw you to him, church? By grace through faith, this is what the Bible says, true followers of Christ will really persevere to the end. If you are saved by grace through faith and you get that and that has changed your life, you will persevere to the end. I was saved when I was five by his grace. I'm now 34 and I'll tell you, I have more passion and love for the gospel now than I did when I was that age. Knowing Jesus propels you. Are you with me? It motivates you. It grows you. And I'm going, I can't wait till I'm 60. If God allows me to tarry, intimacy with him is going to be so much sweeter because I've talked to some people who are older than I am and they're telling me this, it only gets harder, it doesn't get easier. And I go, well, that's good news because that means if I grow more in Jesus, I'll be able to handle that. If I don't and I stay where I'm at, I'll be a 50, 60-year-old freaking out and flipping out all the time. Let me put it this way. I don't want us to be confused. By grace through faith, true followers of Christ will persevere to the end. Every born-again person who truly encounters a life-changing Savior will be preserved to the end because it, salvation is not ours to lose, church. God's the author of it. He holds it. In his hand, Jonah would declare, salvation is of the Lord. It's all through scripture. So please be warned. That I'm not promoting, well, say the sinner's prayer. If you just say, dear God, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. And you keep on living the way you're living. You are not truly saved. But how I, I said a prayer when I was five. The, the marker is this. Has your life changed? That's the marker. Not a prayer. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, pray this prayer. It's not there. But I prayed the sinner's prayer when I was at Bible camp. Yeah, but did it change your life forever? Are you following Jesus, serving Jesus? How about this? Here's why I want to show you that God holds salvation, because God the Father guarantees salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 1, 3 and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Get this. He what? It, it's right there in our Bibles. He has... Did you do it? He has caused us to what? I can't get by that. I didn't cause it. I didn't do it. He did it to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being what? Guarded through you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here's the thing. I don't know your heart. I will never know your heart. But when you stand before God, he will know your heart. And if he's guarded your heart, it's guaranteed. That's why I've had this conversation even with some pastors, and they said, how can you be so positive that God will accept you in the end? And I simply state, salvation was not mine to earn, to gain. It was God's to give. His grace met me, and it changed me. I'm going to stand before God, not on my works, but on Jesus' work. That's why it's guaranteed. Second thing, I want you to see this. It's insured by God the Son, John chapter 10, 27 and 29. Verse is going to come up again. It says this, my sheep hear my voice, and I what? I know them. And what do they do? You need They what? If you're his sheep, you follow him. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And get this. No one will snatch them out of my hand because my Father who has given them to me, who's the chief shepherd church? Jesus. God has given them to him. He's greater than 
all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. How about this? Let's, we've talked about God the Father. Let's talk about, and we talked about God the Son. Let's talk about God the Spirit. Here's why I know salvation is in God's hand, because it's accomplished through who? God the Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. Here's the thing. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. See this, in our salvation, the whole Trinity, although the word Trinity is not found in the Bible, but the concept of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one God is found. And get this, all of them are involved in our salvation. That should just steady you. That should just give you peace of heart. Because this is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If we truly know Jesus, carrying our salvation to the end. And if we do, I will tell you this, church. I've known Jesus now, going on 30 years really soon. And not once have I thought, I wish I didn't know Jesus. If you truly know him, you know him. You grow in him. Now you might think, well, what about those who don't endure, Howie? That's great, but what about those people? What about those who fall away and don't come back? We likely know people, right? At one point, they professed Jesus. They were passionate. They even showed up at church some Sundays. They got baptized, but they're no longer around. And I'll tell you, as a pastor... I've seen people make commitments, get baptized, and even in the life of center point, they're nowhere to be found. But it's not my job to sort out the weeds from the tares. Are you with me? That's God's job. So if you profess Jesus, he's your savior, and you want to follow him in baptism, of course. But we're going to ask you, tell me how you came to know Christ. And and even though I don't know your heart, you can share that. But even in those moments, it doesn't truly mean you came to know Jesus. Well, does the Bible speak to this? Yeah, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. Here's what it says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. The goal isn't to get people in church. The goal is to see people connected to Jesus. Do you know how Center Point will only grow? If people are connected to Jesus, any church. Now, you might say some nice things, get a church full of people, but if they're truly not connected with Jesus, trust me, this message will fly in their face. And they'll simply go, why do I want to come week after week and hear that? Because the gospel is offensive. It is. So the best thing to do is try to avoid it for them, although it's the worst thing they could do. There are many people, and there were some, maybe even many, in these seven churches who were embracing false teaching. You need to see this. This is why Ephesus was uplifted by Jesus because they examined the teachings and there was people probably engaging in it idolatry immorality who would have claimed to be Christians are you with me I meet them all the time but even after these warnings here's the thing they would not repent they wouldn't repent they would not listen and in their re rebellion they would show I'm not truly a follower of Jesus in the first place what Christian being convicted by the Spirit of God would go, no big deal. I can live this way. Let's be real, church. That's not a Christian. A Christian would go, Jesus died for that sin, and I'm committing it. I need to repent. And the good news is, it's not in my own power. He's even given me the Spirit. So he empowers me to move on from it. Any addiction, sin that's repeating over and over in your life, there is only true freedom in the Spirit of God who sets you free. Everything else will mask it, but the Spirit of God will set you free. 
So Christian, let Jesus' warnings here wake you up. Return to him. Refuse to settle for compromise, for complacency. Refuse it. And at the same time, if you profess to be a Christian and you refuse to repent, to turn away, to walk with Jesus, here's what I'd say to you. Be very, 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 very concerned about the condition of your soul because you might not know the Jesus of the Bible. You might have a concept of him, one that was given to you. Oh, he's a, he's a Jesus of love, and he, he will accept you no matter what. Do whatever sin, grace, 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 brother, grace, Christian. Here's what I'd say. Read Galatians. Don't take grace to the, the boundary. Don't step over the boundary and think I can live in sin and still walk with Jesus. Impossible. Verse 6. Let's land the plane. I'll invite Josh up. He'll start playing some music. This way it allows me to finish faster. That's why I have music playing now, so I end. Verse 6, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Here, here's what they were teaching. Uh, we don't know much about them, but probably out of verse 14 and verse 15 of Revelation 2, they probably taught to some degree uh, you can participate in the practices of the culture and still serve Jesus and love Jesus. Uh, that's a lie. You cannot live with one foot in the world and one foot in Jesus. It's impossible. I have Christians say this all the time. Uh, I, I give Jesus my Sundays, but what I do throughout the week, it's, it's about me. No, church, <laughs> you didn't get the gospel. He just doesn't want your heart on Sunday. Right, you can, let's be real. You can come here, be convicted, be challenged, and tomorrow still do what you've always done. Knowing, well, I profess him, but my life hasn't changed. And, and here's what Jesus says. Those teachings of the Nicolaitans, I, I hate them. Did you know this? There's some teachings in Jesus' church that he, he hates. He hates so let's just think about this. Do, do you hate what Jesus hates? Do you love what Jesus loves? And if you're sitting there going, yeah, well, get this. Jesus hates sin. Do you hate your sin? Does it cause you not to run away from Jesus, not to run away from those in church community, but it, does it cause you to repent and come closer to Jesus, come closer to the community? And my fear is in preaching this message, here's what happens to some, but it's the gospel. They will isolate themselves because they feel judged and condemned. Can I tell you, that's Satan. He's condemning you. He's judging you. But Jesus will set you free of that. All I'm doing as a messenger is being faithful in declaring the word of God, church. And if that rubs you the wrong way, I make no apologies. None. I love you in Jesus. I love you too much, church, to keep you where you're at. And the history of Center Point Church is people come, it's cool. Yeah, this is great. The music is awesome. But then they don't want to deal with sin. So they walk away. And I'm not upset about that. That's what the gospel does. But my prayer is that you, if you come back weak, after week, after week, and your life has not changed. Here at church, you might not know him. And Jesus says in verse 7, it's a call to hear and obey. Here's what he says. He who has a what? An ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If any of you are listening, Listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to your heart. To the one who conquers, here's good news. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Church, that's good news. Jesus speaks this way all the time in the Gospels. 
Read, read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Ever, ever read it? If you haven't, spend the afternoon and read it. And here's what you're going to see. Every time Jesus speaks, pretty much he talks in parables. Do you ever wonder why Jesus talked in parables? Because here in Revelation, here's what he's doing. He's talking in a parable. Ever wonder why he does that? Here's why he's doing it, church. It's intended for those who hear to heed the message and obey. It's also intended for those who are disobedient to reject the message further and walk away. Okay? And no warning will be heeded by hardened people who are, in, who are just intent on living in disobedience. Right? Oh, I know I love Jesus. I know I should do that. But man, I love this over here and I'm going to go right back to that. You're not obeying. You're not going to heed the parable that Jesus is talking about. Yet, it's to have a jolting effect on those who are Christians, who are compromising. Ever been there? And then all of a sudden you read that verse and you go, whoa, oh, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. I, I need to repent of that. And it's this jolting effect. Have you ever been there? You sat under a message. You read scripture. Someone has come to you and challenged you. And it's jolted you. And you go, oh, I got to do something. Don't let that pass. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you to deal with that, guess what? That's not meant for tomorrow. That's not meant for a few months down the road. That's meant for today. You might be sitting there going, Howie, right now the Spirit of God is bringing up stuff in my life that I need to repent of, that I need to obey Him. What's your advice? Repent and obey Him. It's pretty simple. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Jesus, for being simplistic to us who are very simple. Repent. Obey. Those who conquer, here's what it says, will eat from the tree of life. Remember that? Genesis. Isn't that good news? There's coming a day when Jesus is going to restore this earth. And someday we're going to be in paradise. There will be no sin. Everything will be at our disposal for his glory and our joy. And it says here someday what? We are going to eat of the tree of life in paradise church. Let me encourage you even though it seems weird to say it, let me encourage you to think about your sin. What? Be encouraged? Yeah. Let's be encouraged to think about our sin. How about this in closing? How do you think you'll be cleansed from that stain? Because I know right now the Spirit of God has brought up a lot of stuff. How do you expect to be cleansed? How? Do, do you have a plan to carry your own sin away? Or are you going to trust God and his plan to carry your sins away? Because I read in the Bible, there is only one mediator between man and God, and that man is Jesus. You want your sins carried away? Only one person can do it. His name is Jesus. He died to pay the penalty for sin. If you trust him, here's what happens. God forgives you. And then he makes you part of his family. This is why we love the church. We were saved individually, but we were saved into a family. Do you know why I love you, church? Because I love Jesus and you're my family. And some of you, you're oddballs. And, and I know I'm, I'm probably the top one, but we love each other. You will be sandpaper to some people, but love will what? Smooth out the sandpaper. It will, church. Trust me. I've been there and I'm the pastor, right? People annoy you and you're like, you're walking and you see them, you're like, ah, oh, turn left. <laughs> and there, the person who only annoys you more is right there. <laughs> and then God is teaching you a valuable lesson. You can never escape my family. That's why I love rural PEI, right? You come to Centerpoint, haven't been here in a while, but I will see you at Superstore. And you will go, just by seeing Pastor Howie, whoops, I haven't been in church in a while. I hope he doesn't see me. Oh, he's seen me. I'll be there next Sunday, which you never are, but I love you. Praying for you. 
Christian, remember this. Remember the way you felt when you first loved the one who first loved you. Remember that day? Do you? Remember the joy? Probably tears. Even men shedding tears because the grace of God has touched their lives. Uh, again, I was talking to a pastor on Friday and he said this. He said, how I, I was opening up for different bands. They were well-known bands. Like I was about to open up for Brian Adams. I was in the drug scene. I was doing whatever I wanted. And one day, one night, driving in my car on the way to the concert, tears filled my eyes. And I knew right there that Jesus changed me. And I walked away from it all. Not that concerts are evil, but... My life was all about me, and now I serve Jesus. That pastor, by the way, is Dave Story, who I told you about at the start of the message. And then you wonder, passion for God? Like, Jesus is amazing, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father.